three Democrats and two Republicans are running for South Carolina House District 113, formerly held by Seth Whipper. In this edition of Quintess Post Ops, I sit down with one of the candidates, Rousey Bob Fee, and be sure to download the free Quintess Close Ops app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Rousey, it is so good to see you. Good to meet you. Likewise. Pleasure. Thank you. I've heard a lot of great things about you. Well, oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, let me jump into the obvious because you posted this on Facebook on July 10th. Okay. It's official. Threw my hat in the ring at 1.32 p.m. on July 10th, 2017 to be the Republican nominee for the special election to the South Carolina House of Representatives, District 113. Thank you for your continued support. I'm thinking this, why Ruzi right now? Why Ruzi right now? Um, it's a good question. And the best answer I have is because it's the right thing to do. I've been given a lot of opportunities and that a lot of people, especially in District 113, simply have not been given. And it all kind of stems back from, um, I, I would, I guess it was my first act of political defiance or activism okay. um, that I actually posted on my Facebook page. I don't know if you saw it. Okay. But the reason I have a unique name, Ruzi, right, is because I was born in Iran. Right. And uh, my mom uh, moved me to Los Angeles in the mid '80s wow. when I was about six, seven years old, uh, because there was a war, uh, the Iran-Iraq War, right. that was raging on over there, and my dad stayed behind to you know, support us as best as he could. Yeah. Anyway, so when the war ended, uh, my mom said, hey, you know what, let's go see your dad. <laughs> right? So I was like, all right. So I was about 12 or 13, and I remember I was sitting there watching, you know, state-run television, right. and, uh, you know, they were burning the American flag, right, and saying, death to America. Now, in parentheses, a lot of people I met there love America. Right, so I just wanted to differentiate between right. the people and what sure. the government did. So, you know, right then and there, it's about 12 or 13, and I just got this sense of, that's my flag you're burning. Mm -hmm. Right, and I borrowed some money from my mom, and I went down to the paint store, and I bought three spray cans. Mm -hmm. uh, this was one of many different acts that I did uh, to my parents' displeasure. But, um, so came back and we were, we were living at my grandmother's house at the time, so came back, took these three cans, red, white, and blue, right. and I spray painted uh, the American flag, and I recited the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. So, I don't know which neighbor it was, whoever it was, they didn't like that very much. And they called uh, what, it's called the Basij, the, um, the Islamic militia, right? So they come, they arrest me, again, I'm 12 or 13, I don't know what the heck's going on. And um, fortunately, my dad had some pull, so right. it wasn't you know that, that big of a deal. But to come back to your question of why this is, when he sat me down, it was, I mean, I had the fear of God with my dad sitting me down, like, I'm like oh man, I'm in trouble, <laughs> right? And he sat me down, he's like, listen, you could have gotten us a lot of trouble doing that, so don't do that again, which I did, but that's besides the point. What he, what he did say is, I'm really proud of you for standing up for what you believe in, right? And never change that aspect of your life or your personality. And to that end, I moved here two and a half years ago, almost three years ago. Wow. And part of my business is to recruit and train. So I go through a lot of resumes, I see a lot of things, and I realized it was incredibly hard to find the right people to work with here. So I started digging around and seeing statistics. And frankly, the statistics I saw were just so atrocious that I could not believe it. Um, you know, when I saw, you know, I think I was talking to one of my friends, and I said, did you know that the ranking for South Carolina education just came back at 50? And his response was, well, a couple of years ago we were 48th, and you know, I guess now we're worse than Mississippi. You know, nothing wrong with Mississippi. I'm sure it's great people. Right, right, right. Um, now, I don't have a family right now. Right, but I do plan on, you know, building here, right? This, this is where I'm going to live, and this is where I'm going to have a family. And I don't want to raise a family when the, the statistic we're on 50th in the, in the nation. Okay. Right, so that's part of why I'm doing this, is to, to make where I'm living, where you're living, where hopefully my family will be living a lot better place. Mm. 
Let me go to July 15th. You said the following Facebook quote. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the table set after the filing period closed at noon today. There are three remarkable, talented Democrats, another Republican, and myself running to represent our respective parties, and ultimately, District 113. Primary elections are on September 5th, and the winners go on to the special election on November 7th. So write the headline for me. Rosie Vafi, will do, Vafi, yeah. pardon me, will do what on September 5th? On the morning of September 5th or the entire day? The entire day. Uh, well, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to wake up and I'm going to walk my dog. Um, ideally, I'd like to walk him to the polling station, but he's kind of <laughs> injured, so I can't do that. Oh. Um, so walk him, eat my breakfast, and then go vote and try to campaign and get my, as many people out there to vote as possible mm. because I think it's our solemn duty to, to participate in this great democracy. Yeah. Let me go back to the issues. Obviously, there are a lot of issues affecting House District 113. Yeah. When you think of them, what sticks out to you? Well, they're actually inter intertwined. Sure, go for it. Um, I would say, and that's where my platform is actually just one big circular factor, education and jobs are the things that pop up to me, right? Because those two together can fix crime and poverty. Okay. Okay? So. One thing I've learned with Charleston in general is, uh, and South Carolina actually, there are only a few industries in this state, right? There's manufacturing, right. so you have Boeing, right. Right? you have tourism, right. and you have shipping. Right. right. We're sitting on a time bomb. Okay, this is an economic time bomb because we're used to dealing with hurricanes or tropical storms right. or in my case, Southern California earthquakes right. um, or, you know, or terrorism. Um, but those are things that we can't really control, right? The one silent, deadly time bomb is the economy, okay? And South Carolina is sitting on that time bomb. Because just imagine for a second, if, you know, the, we hit another recession, right? Or a global recession or, or you know, just a country in a recession. Um, well, Boeing is going to start firing people, right? Because they're a corporation, they need to make money. Okay. They're going to fire people. Sure. Volvo is going to fire people. BMW is going to fire people. When the, when they when BMW is not filling up those cargo ships, well, guess what? Those cargo ships aren't going to come to the harbor anymore. Okay. And you just lost a lot of jobs. Right. And now if the recession is even worse, then you're not going to have tourists. So basically, all three of South Carolina's main industries, especially Charleston, are affected by this. Mm. Right. So my proposal um, that I've actually spoken in depth with uh, community leaders now is to, to create a new industry, a new sector, right? a high-tech one, right? because another aspect of it is you look at the manufacturing jobs, they pretty much cap at 75,000 on average. Right? I mean, it's like if, you, if you've done this for a couple of years, you're going to have a seventy-five, eighty thousand dollar $80,000 salary and you're going to you know, live your life. Right? But if you go look at high tech jobs, they start at 75,000, 80,000, okay? So the next problem with that is, well, we're not qualified to have high tech jobs. And I ask, why not? Why aren't we? Okay? So you address that problem, and that's why I have this proposal of you introducing a bill sure. to get private corporations to invest in our educational system, and in turn, the, the sponsored students will go back and work for these corporations, right? So now, what's in it for the corporations? First of all, part of the bill will be to reduce the corporate income tax. Okay. Okay, to make it a lot more beneficial for them to want to come invest here. Because right now, even if we do reduce the corporate income tax, it doesn't matter because they can't hire anyone because there's no one to fill those jobs. So they have to import those jobs. And we don't want that because we want people in District 113 and the rest of South Carolina to have those jobs. Okay. Right? Because, you know, fine, I came down here from California, I'm glad I did. But, you know, we want, I want my neighbors to have the jobs. Okay. Right? I want my neighbor to make $100,000. Right? So, let's say whatever company X comes in, goes to Noah Charleston High School, 12th grader, is like, hey, you know what? We're going to pay for your tuition at Trinity or at College Charleston right. and in two years, three years, four years, 
you're going to come back and you're going to work with us for this salary and for four years or six years or however long, right? And that's the plan. When you think of the crime, the recent crime here in North Charleston, what goes to your mind? The recent crime? Like yes, the uptick in, in crime? Yes, sir. So I was at the community meeting on Monday, um, and the officer did explain that there is an uptick in crime. Mm -hmm. And I've actually spoken in depth with um, a lot of police officers in the last, prior to announcing my campaign and, um, and since. Besides budgeting issues, which um, I think can be managed differently, but I'm not, a, I'm not a police administrator, so I don't know, but I would like to actually talk to an expert about how to budget things a little differently. There's, unanimously, they've said there needs to be better police community relationships. Okay, I was shocked that there's no neighborhood watch program in my neighborhood in Park Circle. Right, so I took the flyer from the police officer and I posted on it on, on the Park Circle thing that, hey, you know what guys, let's start a neighborhood watch program. Right, why? Because that, sent, that builds a sense of community. Right, because if you're my neighbor, I don't want someone breaking into your place. I don't want someone breaking into your car. I don't want someone selling drugs right. around the corner. Sure. Right. I don't want your kid. Well, I don't know if you have kids, but I don't. Want, you know, your kids to, you know, see someone, you know, doing something illegal. Right. So that's an influence. Right? right. They're impressionable. So I think there definitely needs to be a better sense of community police relationships because they can't do everything. Right. I think. I mean, don't quote me on this, but I think the officer said they have 400 police officers in North Charleston. That's a really big territory for such a small group of people, right. right? And you know we don't have street cameras. You know there's there's some civil liberty issues with that, but you know we need the public to actually participate in helping the police. Yeah. And I want to go back to the website because you went on to write this quote: "I've always aspired to travel, see different cultures." and discover as much as I can about the world we live in. Growing up, politics was a fascination of mine, and my dream job was to join the Foreign Service. In the pursuit, I received a Bachelor's of Political Science from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. I then continued on to receive a Master's in Comparative Politics from the London School of Economics and a Master's in Public and International Law from the University of Hels uh, Helsinki. Helsinki. Yeah. What is the difference between the world then and now in your mind? Oh gosh. Well, um, so the world, not just my world, but I think everyone's sure. world changed on September 11, 2001. Right. Um, I think that's undeniable. I think we went from uh, being inclusive and open, um, a global society, to much more protective, right? Not just as Americans, but every country. Sure. Um, and at the same time, though, you, you know, when you travel, you just experience different things. I mean, I don't know, where, where, have, you, where have you traveled to? Uh, not out of the country, but Chicago, D.C. Okay. So even when you go to Chicago or D.C., don't you just experience something different, right? right? I mean, like, you, when you go have a pizza in Chicago, it's really different when you have a deep dish here. Right. For example, <laughs> right? Um, so just imagine that and going to, um, you know, Finland or Sweden or, or uh, I mean I haven't been to Africa but I really want to, uh, one of my friends is going to South Africa so I'm really jealous. Um, but imagine going, you know, imagine being 12 yeah. and going from Los Angeles to the Middle East. Sure. You know, being completely, it's a culture shock. Yeah. But in a way that shock is, I think, healthy. And I, I wish I could encourage everyone um, to, to send their kids three months out of the year in high school or something, to just go travel, go do something, you know, a study block program. I know at the time, not everyone can afford it, but I wish there would be some kind of charity or something that would, that would contribute to that because I think it would really influence uh, the development and child's development. Mm -hmm. Lastly, you wrote this, quote, upon successfully launching the Alabama division, I relocated to Charleston, South Carolina. Prior to moving here, when someone asked where home is, my answer was, quote, wherever I lay my head, unquote. However, after only a short time here, I realized all the roads that I have taken through my life led me to finally find peace here. 
I bought my first house in District 113 because Charleston is home now in South Carolina is where I belong. Beyond this race, what in your mind says this is going to be my future? I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, like politically, business-wise? All of it. All of it. Personally? Yeah. When you look into that crystal ball, what do you see in your future? No, oh, jeez. I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do I see? Um, well, obviously, I see, I see this race. Um, I also, personally, um, I have my you know, personal aspirations right now. Obviously, they were my dog. I don't know if right. you saw that. Right, right, right. So, personally, he's taking up a lot of my time. Um, professionally, I'm, I'm trying to you know, make this, this office that we have um, as successful as the other offices are. And um, you know, it's been challenging, and it's even more challenging now that I'm essentially running a campaign. Right. Um, so my personal aspirations, I don't know. I, I assume, you know, at my age, I'd, I'd like to settle down at some point and uh, start a family. That's on a personal basis. I'm not entirely sure I'm going to get another dog. It's, it's actually emotionally draining. I don't, I, know. I don't know if you've uh, had to deal with it, but yes. it's, it's, it's exhausting. Um, politically, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'm going to go along with this election and kind of see what happens, but okay. I do have a strong sense of civic duty. Mm. Um, whether that's going to be helping at a polling station or going and helping campaigns or running for re-election, hopefully. Um, I, I do think I want to continue participating in politics in some form. Mm -hmm. Well, Rousey Vapi, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. I really appreciate this. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Anytime.